Real quick, this is part three of the Guilty Gear Retrospective. If you haven't seen the last two, head back over to my channel and give those a watch. But if you're all caught up, then let's keep on rocking. Following the crushing blow Arc System Works faced with Guilty Gear 2 Overture, Daisuke Ishiwatari quietly began drafting up ideas for the next entry in the Guilty Gear series. However, with Sega Sammy Holdings as the rights holder for many of the assets in the IP, Daisuke and company had to shelve the project until negotiations between Sega and ASW concluded with favorable results. In the meantime, veteran Guilty Gear developer Toshi Michimori had already begun development on a new fighting game series, Blaze Blue, which is heavily inspired by Guilty Gear's core gameplay. As mentioned in the previous video, Daisuke would go on to support as the lead composer for the series, with the exception of Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle, because no sane man would want their name tied to that game. He would also go to work under his former assistant Hideyuki Anbei for the futuristic side-scrolling shooter Hardcore Uprising as both lead composer and art director. Negotiations with Sega Sammy finally proved fruitful, and Arc System Works secured the rights to the Guilty Gear franchise, officially trademarking the IP in May of 2011. Work began soon thereafter, with minimal information on what direction Daisuke and the newly minted Team Red would take the series. Fans, as usual, speculated, and assumed that Guilty Gear would see something in the same vein as Blaze Blue, as the game was praised for its gorgeous high-resolution sprite work. However, at the 2013 Arc System Works Festival, Daisuke Ishiwatari delivered the unexpected. Yes, Arc System Works' big reveal was Guilty Gear XR utilizing cell shaded 3D models. In an interview with Japanese news source 4Gamer.net, Ishiwatari revealed that the game was being developed on Epic's Unreal Engine 3, and for multiple reasons. First and foremost, Arc System Works' main goal was to create a visually appealing fighting game that can still capture the anime aesthetics that Guilty Gear was known for. Secondly, they were in the market for an affordable game engine that was compatible with both the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4 platforms. You see, Guilty Gear 2 Overture was developed with an expensive in-house engine that was already outdated by the time ASW regained the rights to Guilty Gear. They couldn't afford the time or resources to build a new one from scratch. And at the same time that Arc System Works was weighing their options, Epic Games announced the launch of Unreal Engine 4, and subsequently slashed the prices for Unreal Engine 3, making it the obvious choice. Lead programmer Takuro Iyumi went on to elaborate that while the option to use Unreal Engine 4 was still on the table, Unreal Engine 3 was already proven to run on both PS3 and PS4, and being that UE3 first launched in 2005, it was a tried and true engine with extensive research notes from other developers. Using Unreal Engine 3 meant that Team Red didn't have to worry about potential bugs and problems with the largely unknown Unreal Engine 4. All they needed to do was to apply their in-house tools and logic to Unreal Engine 3 and get to work. Guilty Gear XR Sign was released on February 20th, 2014 for the Sega Ring Edge 2 arcade system and was later ported to the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4 in Japan and North America in December of the same year. Coming stock with 14 characters, it was the first game in the series to offer additional characters via DLC. Sign was designed to be a soft reboot for the franchise, one that was intended to be as accessible to as many new players as possible. Speaking with Femitsu in mid-2014, Daisuke revealed that one of the first steps towards accessibility was expanding the input buffer for a character's moveset. Previous Guilty Gear games had a notoriously strict input window for executing combos. Xard would increase the leniency of these inputs considerably, or as he puts it, allowing inputs to precede other inputs. Another step towards simplifying combat was to modify and expand the Roman Cancel system. Now, any time a player had used a Roman Cancel, time slows down to where the opponent's movement speed is briefly cut in half, allowing the player to quickly assess the game state and execute their best options on the fly. Roman Cancels are broken down even further by color coding them. The traditional Roman Cancel is now the Red Roman Cancel, where during an attack where the opponent is either in hit or block stun, or while the enemy is using a blue psych burst, you are able to suspend the animation. Yellow Roman Cancels or YRCs activate during the startup frames of an attack, movement, or neutral state when the opponent is not in hit or block stun, 
at the cost of 25% meter. And these are commonly used to give opening attacks a more frame advantage. Finally, Purple Roman Cancels or PRCs are often your panic button option, where you can activate them during the late active or recovery frames of an attack that you've whiffed. And unlike previous entries, almost any attack can be Roman Cancelled with a few exceptions, in which case you'll get a large red X appearing over your character. The Guard Gauge is now referred to as Risk Level, operating in the same way as previous installments. A new defensive technique is added to the universal mechanics called Blitz Shield, where at the cost of 25% meter, you can temporarily stun your opponent's attack or repel projectiles. It won't stop throws or overdrive, so don't be stupid. Sign also sees the introduction to the controversial Clash system. Not that there weren't any Clashes in X2, but now Clashes can initiate Danger Time. When Danger Time is active, damage is increased by 20%, and any attack that can be Roman cancelled will result in a Mortal Counter. Mortal Counters automatically trigger counter hit effects, along with more hit stop and slowdown. At first, that would sound beneficial, but executing your go-to bread and butter combos could be hindered when the expected launch trajectory of the opponent is altered by the effects of Mortal Counters. Finally, status effects called Hellfire pops off when your remaining health reaches a value of 20% or less, and while in Hellfire, all overdrives deal an additional 20% of damage. In regards to the game features, Story Mode ditches the visual novel style of storytelling and goes full-blown anime. Unlike older games, there are no bouts of combat between chapters and plot points, so the viewer can relax and enjoy the batshit crazy headcanon of Daisuke Ishiwatari at their own pace. The Dojo sub-menu offers different training tools that you should be familiar with, such as Tutorial Mode, Mission Mode, Training Mode, and the brand new Challenge Mode. Challenge Mode has pre-generated combos that teach you both simple and complex combo routes for each character so that you get a feel for their playstyle. Mission Mode now operates much in the same manner as previous titles, but is far more explicit in teaching you the special tech that Guilty Gear has to offer, along with teaching general fighting game theory that's found in any game. Plus, it even offers character-specific challenges to prep you for different matchups. Finally, there's the revamped Medal of Millionaire mode, which is completely different from the X2 formula. Instead of running the survival-style gauntlet from older games, a grid is used to select which enemies you plan on facing. This time around, your opponents have altered attributes and equipable items, such as resistance to combo chains, being unable to block or using bombs to zone you out. Enemies also have multiple health bars, so killing them once isn't just going to cut it. However, when you do score the KO, you earn medals that can be used as currency to upgrade your own attributes like strength, technique, or magic scores, your own items to harass the enemy, or equipable accessories that will boost other attributes. Throughout the matches, health carries over from battle to battle as you traverse your way through the grid. Upon defeating these enemies, your opponents will drop a chest with special goodies inside, ranging from more medals to rare accessories and items. Initially, these chests are simple to open, just shwack them a few times and they'll burst. But as you make your way through Medal of Millionaire's more challenging encounters, you'll find different colored chests that will require other methods for you to open. Green chest? Set that bitch on fire. Winged chest? Chase it down while it bounces away from you. Your goal is to target enemies with stars in their cell, signifying a more challenging opponent. Once you've defeated enough of these starred enemies, a crowned enemy will appear on the grid for you to challenge, and if you're victorious, the grid expands with even more difficult enemies to fight. All in all, there's over 200 unique encounters in this mode, offering hours of offline gameplay, really encapsulating the best parts of survival mode and old school Medal of Millionaire, and combining them into this fun little minigame. Guilty Gear Xrd Sign was very favorably received by fans and critics alike, especially for a vanilla version of the game, something that Capcom can probably learn from in the future. Giant Bomb selected it as the best-looking fighting game of 2014, praising its crazy polygonal anime madness and the dynamic camera work with the dust and overdrive attacks. Hardcore gamers Jeff Tho ranked it as number 3 on the year-end list for 2014, only falling short to Dragon Age Inquisition and Hearthstone. Sure, dude. It was also nominated as the best fighting game for IGN, Hardcore Gamer, the Game Critic Awards, and 2015's Game Awards. Sign also brought Guilty Gear back to the tournament scene, starting with Kumite in Tennessee in early 2015, and eventually made its way to EVO's main stage, which hadn't seen a Guilty Gear title outside of side events since 2009 for Accent Core Plus. In fact, Guilty Gear Sign saw the most tournament entries in the series' history, especially in the West where it had appeared at at least a minimum of 15 venues before the release of its second installment, 
Guilty Gear Exard Revelator. Revelator continued Sign's effort in being the most accessible Guilty Gear platform by introducing a new control scheme known as Stylish Mode. With Stylish Mode, new players don't have to learn complex combo routes, and instead can chain normal attacks and auto combos by the press of a single button. The special button also gives players the ability to perform specials and overdrives, plus Stylish players can automatically block mid and high attacks in neutral. The trade-off here is that auto combos are often very mediocre in both damage output and screen position, and stylish players take on an additional 20% damage from the enemy. Other new and returning mechanics include throw breaks and the homing dash, which is a slight adjustment from Sign's grounded dust input. Homing dash forces you, albeit momentarily, to chase the tumbling opponent and extends the tumble for a slightly longer period of time. This input can be botched if you don't hold forward or if you accidentally jump, which usually resets both players back to neutral. Blitz shields are slightly altered, now marginally refilling the burst gauge after a successful rejection, and they can be followed up by a blitz attack by holding down heavy slash. Finally, burst overdrives are introduced, as the character's cinematic overdrives can be augmented by entering the motion command with dust instead of the original attack input. This will cost you 50% meter and your burst gauge, but is typically reserved for trying to close out the match. Burst overdrives dish out an additional 25% more damage than regular overdrives, and will also recover a third of your burst gauge on hit. Tutorial mode flips the script from being a by-the-numbers input checklist to a series of mini-games, aiding the player by engaging different movement and execution options. Honestly, it's a great tool for anyone who's trying their hand at 2D fighters for the first time. The CPU goads the player into chasing these tiny minions that can only be defeated by attacking with specific buttons or extended combos. There's also a few extra goodies, like Gallery Mode, which shows off all sorts of art, short films, and music that can be used within the game. There's also Replay Mode, while not equipped with the ability to take control of a match like in Plus R, it does offer a neat dynamic camera effect, allowing you to observe your battles from all different angles, even removing the HUD if you don't like it. Fishing also helps you unlock different assets from your R code, and there's seven new characters that are added to the roster. XR got one last small revision in the form of Guilty Gear XR Rev 2. Released in early 2017, Rev 2 offered mostly minor changes like a HUD overhaul, camera adjustment, additional and modified command normals, new story scenarios, and two extra characters. Like its predecessors, Revelator and Rev 2 were an overwhelming success, with critics happily welcoming the changes and additions noting that Guilty Gear XR finally feels like a completed game. Its tutorial system was noted as one of XR's strongest assets, being praised by PlayStation Universe's Gary Bagdasarov as one of the best teaching tools for fighting games they've ever played. TJ Denzer of Arcade Sushi praised the overhaul given to the online mode, making it easier for players to properly match up against each other in lobbies and private rooms. And both entries had been nominated for the Fighting Game of the Year award from both the National Academy of Video Game Trade Reviewers and the DICE Awards. As for me, Guilty Gear Xard is my absolute favorite fighting game of all time. The most important attribute I look for in fighting games is the number of offensive and defensive options I have at any given situation that's not just do the combo. Xard has seven different mechanics just with meter alone. That's not even counting the burst options. The speed and intensity of the gameplay is set just right for my taste. It has some of the slickest character designs that exude this over-the-top bravado, which translates one-to-one -to, -one to their playstyle. And that soundtrack! Oh my god, that soundtrack is an absolute killer. Break a Spell, Heavy Day, Marionette, Big Bang Sonic, Rokuman, the overwhelming majority of this OST is just saturated in emotion-laced virtuosity. It's just perfect. Guilty Gear XR had a very impressive run within the modern FGC, and was finally inching ever closer to worldwide success, even ending up on ESPN at one point. But while XR had earned the adoration of from fighting game fans all over, it still wasn't enough for the series to break the mainstream barrier. Even with all the changes made to the system mechanics and trying to make the experience as inclusive as possible, Guilty Gear couldn't shake off its mantle of complexity. As XR drew closer to its twilight years, tournament attendance dwindled down as newer IPs began to take its place. The joint venture between Bandai Namco and ASW produced Dragon Ball Fighter Z, one of the most lucrative fighting games in the last decade. 
and other newer titles such as SNK Samurai Showdown and Mortal Kombat 11 pushed Rev 2 to side tournaments. However, a dedicated community continued to push the game to its absolute limits, providing some of the most insane high-level gameplay ever seen. Unfortunately, due to the 2020 pandemic forcing offline tournaments to shut down, Xart hasn't been able to maintain a strong online presence like its competitors, and the existing community is heavily splintered by region due to its delay-based netcode. Jeremy Dunham's review of Guilty Gear X2 truly encapsulates the struggle that the series has faced since its inception. The story of Daisuke Ishiwatari, and with it Guilty Gear, is one of being the perpetual underdog. He was just some college kid at some no-name studio that gave him a little bit of money to make his dreams come true. And with that, challenged the fighting game titans like Capcom and SNK. While there were technically no shortage of recognition given to him by critics, Guilty Gear was always overshadowed by those who came before it. Honestly, if only it had a Capcom logo on the cover, maybe things would have been different. But here we are, 20 some odd years later, and Daisuke is still fighting climbing ever closer to the apex of the fighting game genre. Guilty Gear Strive is nearly at our doorstep, and while there's probably enough data to analyze and dissect it, I would love to give Strive time to prove itself before going to the deep dive. I think I speak for most of us in saying that expectations could not be higher. There's been a considerable amount of risk taken with this game, and even some questioning the identity of the IP itself. But if Guilty Gear has proven anything, it's that it's always strived to push the limits of what the fighting game genre can accomplish. And with that, the Guilty Gear Retrospective is done, at least for the time being. I know that there's an open beta next week, but it didn't seem right to start doing a retrospective for a game that isn't even out yet. Like, we know the mechanics and everything, but maybe we'll save something like that for a review, or maybe I'll revisit it after Season 1 is complete. With that, I hope that you enjoyed this journey as much as I enjoyed navigating through it. Like always, like, comment, subscribe, tell me what your favorite moments from Guilty Gear is, or tell me what your favorite fighting game is, what game you want to see later on. Uh, I am branching out away from fighting games just for a little bit because I want to be able to, you know, do other things. Uh... With that said, it is 12.42 a.m. right now. I am going to bed, so I will see you guys next time. Take care.